Hello everyone, welcome to session four of LTech 623. Let me begin by saying thanks for the insightful reflections related to Critical Reflection 3. You really took a microscope to the Jigsaw Method Chalk and Talk video, which is just what I was hoping for. Most of you connected to the readings and use concrete and detailed examples to justify your analyses. That's great work. Now, if you haven't already, I want to encourage everyone to watch your classmates' videos. Collectively, the observations and connections you've been making are quite rich. And so watching those videos is a great way to extend our learning. One of the themes that came up in this week's assignment is the realization that there is a pedagogical layer that goes with or on top of the three independent dimensions of video. And as creators of educational videos, we have to keep this important layer in mind. In other words, we have to distinguish and complement expertise with media with expertise in pedagogical practice. And as shown here, the pedagogical layer invites us to think about instructional methods, such as learning by example or learning by doing, as well as the different phases of instruction, not to mention various presentation considerations that are likely to influence the viewer's cognitive processing. Of course, all three of these considerations interact with the independent dimensions of video we've been talking about thus far. Our job is to begin developing some experience in all of these different areas. With that in mind, we're going to get a bit more technical the next few weeks. We'll do this by focusing on production value, all of the technical aspects of video production. And we're going to start somewhat counterintuitively, not by focusing on video, but by learning about audio and more specifically, the relationship between audio quality and people's perceptions. Think of it this way. We want to try to answer the question, to what extent does audio quality matter in the visual medium of video? Now, to speak to this question, let's turn to an article titled, Good Sound, Good Research, How Audio Quality Influences Perceptions of the Research and Researcher. This is from a 2018 article in Science Communication. Now, in this article, Newman and Schwartz, different Schwartz, by the way, argue that cognitive tasks can be described along a continuum from effortless to highly effortful. In turn, this produces a corresponding metacognitive experience that ranges from fluent to disfluent. Importantly, psychological research shows that when messages are difficult to process, people think they are less compelling. In fact, there's quite a bit of evidence that says that even incidental variables, such as font color and difficult to pronounce names, could create a feeling of disfluency that in turn leads people to generate lower impressions of the message and the messenger. Now, this is critical. Basically, it's saying that things that have nothing to do with the actual message or the messenger have been found to have an impact on what people deem compelling. So, knowing this, our humble scholars, Newman and Schwartz, wanted to answer the following question. How does sound quality alter listeners' impressions of science and scientists? So, to answer that question, they conducted an experiment involving two YouTube videos, which they acoustically altered such that they had either high-quality audio or low-quality audio. So, what do you think happened? Did the sound quality change the listener's impressions? Well, let's walk through their findings. You could see here on the vertical axis, we have a rating scale from 1 to 5, where the lower the score means the more negative their impression and the higher the score means a more positive impression. And then on the x-axis along the bottom, we have four categories. Was the talk good? Was the speaker smart? Was the speaker likable? And was the research important? So here are the findings. You can see that the blue or the high quality audio significantly outscored the low quality audio and that that difference was statistically significant. The same pattern was found for whether or not the speaker was smart, although the difference was not as dramatic. We see a similar pattern with whether or not the participants liked the speaker and whether or not they thought the research was important. 
So stepping back, this tells us that yes, the audio quality of video does influence viewers' evaluations of the topic and the person speaking about the topic. They did a follow-up study to find out if the subject matter of the video mattered in terms of how important sound quality was to the viewer's impressions. They did this by comparing a physics talk to an engineering talk. Now, I won't go through all of this, but the short answer is that the subject matter of the talk didn't matter. In other words, the only thing that mattered was audio quality. So this is something we have to keep in mind as we create our educational videos. And we'll be learning how to manage audio quality in this week's assignment. So the next question, of course, is, well, what are the characteristics of good audio or of a good voice? Now, here's an article I found from 2013 titled, What Makes a Good Voice for Radio? Perceptions of Radio Employers and Educators. Now, part of this study involved a review of existing literature on what radio employers and educators believe makes a good voice for radio. And here's a list of some of the communicative characteristics they identified as significant, such as a well-defined articulatory pattern and flawless enunciation. The speakers should have correct or acceptable pronunciation. They should use pauses, timing, and emphasis effectively, and they should also vary their pitch, loudness, and tone. And as many of you pointed out in the Jigsaw Method video, is the voice should be natural and have a conversational delivery style. Now importantly, the radio speakers also had to have a good personality that was classified as pleasant, natural, full of vitality, friendly, adaptable, confident, sincere, and honest. So those are some of the communicative characteristics of effective radio performers. And we should keep these in mind as we're thinking about recording audio voiceovers for our Chalk and Talk videos. Now finally, I want to talk a little bit about how fast we should speak. And I did a lot of reading to try to find out whether or not there is an ideal words per minute that we should use when speaking on video. Now, some people claim that for voice casts or recording voiceovers, that you want to speak between 120 and 140 words per minute. In fact, some people have actually analyzed TED Talks to see how fast people speak. However, others argue that TED Talks are too artificial because they're really rehearsed speeches, and therefore we really shouldn't pay attention to how fast or slow the presenters speak. One interesting article I wanted to share is called Public Speaking, How Fast to Speak. And this is by Charles Crawford. And in this article, Crawford argues that there's a huge difference in the options a speaker has for conveying tone, authority, impact, and humor. He states that it's really not about words per minute. And to illustrate this point, he shows samples of two well-known speakers. One of them is Barack Obama from his 2008 victory speech, where he speaks at 149 words per minute. So let's go ahead and listen to former President Obama. This election had many firsts and many stories that will be told for generations, but one that's on my mind tonight is about a woman who cast her ballot in Atlanta. She is a lot like the millions of others who stood in line to make their voice heard in this election, except for one thing. Ann Nixon Cooper is 106 years old. She was born just a generation past slavery, a time when there were no cars on the road or planes in the sky, when someone like her couldn't vote for two reasons, because she was a woman, and because of the color of her skin. And tonight, I think about all that she's seen throughout her century in America, the heartache and the hope, the struggle and the progress, the times we were told that we can't, and the people who pressed on with that American creed, yes, we can. At a time when women's voices were silenced and their hopes dismissed, she lived to see them stand up and speak out and reach for the ballot. Yes, we can. When there was despair in the Dust Bowl and depression across the land, she saw a nation conquer fear itself with a new deal, new jobs, a new sense of common purpose. Yes, we can. 
Okay, great. So that's Obama, obviously speaking extremely effectively at about 149 words per minute. Now, let's contrast that with this clip of Jim Carrey speaking at the 2016 Golden Globes. What you'll notice is he is speaking much slower at 89 words per minute. But of course, his speech is also extremely effective and powerful. So let's take a listen. From the upcoming film, True Crimes, please welcome two-time Golden Globe winner, Jim Carrey. Thank you. I am two-time Golden Globe winner, Jim Carrey. You know, when I go to sleep at night, I'm not just a guy going to sleep. I'm two-time Golden Globe winner, Jim Carrey going to get some well-needed shut-eye. And when I dream, I don't just dream any old dream. No, sir. I dream about being three-time Golden Globe winning actor Jim Carrey. Because then I would be enough. Okay, that's a little bit of information about the role audio plays in ensuring a high production value in video. And as you'll see in this week's assignment, we'll learn some more about the more technical aspects of capturing quality voiceovers. And I'm afraid we'll have to leave it at that because we're out of time for today. Have a great week, everyone, and I'll see you in Canvas.